Welcome everyone to St. Louis University and to the second event of the Religion and Conflict Social Issues series this academic year. My name is Rachel Lindsay, and I'm a faculty member in SLU's Department of Theological Studies, where I teach courses on American religion and theories and mechanisms of religion. I am joined by my colleagues, Professor Elizabeth Black and Professor Pauline Lee, who are running the webinar portion of tonight's event. We are delighted to have so many people participating in person and online tonight from both our SLU community as well as those from across the world. The Religion and Conflict Social Issues series was begun by SLU's Department of Theological Studies in the wake of the deadly white supremacist rally in Charlottesville, Virginia in August 2017. Eager to condemn the racism of this violent rally and to provide a space for dialogue for members of the SLU community, the department organized its first conversation on racism and God talk in September 2017, out of which this series was born. We have since engaged numerous topics of enormous consequence through the lens of theology and religion, topics including racism, sexism, incarceration, immigration, politics, and law. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Live Religion Individual Age Project, which I co-direct with Professor Lee. Supported by the Henry Luce Foundation and St. Louis University College of Arts and Sciences, Lived Religion in a Digital Age seeks to better understand religion in American public life through collaboration with members of local communities representing diverse traditions, histories, and practices. Attending to sites, sounds, and space, as well as the teachings and texts, our research team, including research and teaching fellows, resident artists, and faculty across the discipline, works to develop richer understandings of religion as it is lived and studied in the complex realities of modern life. Tonight's event is one of several events on campus this week that seek to engage issues of justice in relation to immigration, race, and religion at SLU in the St. Louis region and around the country. On Friday night, photographer Tom Pieper, whose work works we are standing, sitting in this right now. Photographer Tom Pieper will be giving artist talks both here at SLUA from 5.30 to 6.30 and at the Museum of Contemporary Religious Art, just a 10 minute walk onto Sluice campus, past the clock tower from 7 to 8 p.m. On Saturday, November 6th, SLU will be hosting a student panel and live stream of the El Paso border maps for the campus community in partnership with the Peace and Justice Commission of the Archdiocese at Sania. And later that afternoon, Professor Vargas will join Tom Pieper, Professor Elizabeth Eichmann, and Professor Petruda Lepon for a conversation about this work. That conversation will be held at 3 p.m. in, in Anheuser-Busch Auditorium at the Sluice Cook Hall, right across the street on Lindell. Now, it is my great honor to introduce tonight's speaker. Daisy Vargas is an assistant professor of religious studies at the University of Arizona. Dr. Vargas specializes in Catholicism of the Americas, race, ethnicity, and religion in the United States, and Latina Latino religion. Her current project, Mexican Religion on Trial, Race, Religion, and the Law in the U.S.-Mexico Borderlands, traces the history of Mexican religion, race, and law from the 19th century into the contemporary moment, positioning current legal debates about Mexican religion within a longer and larger history of anti-Mexican and anti-Catholic attitudes in the U.S. She has served as an ethnographic field research researcher for the Institute for the Study of Immigration and Religion since 2012. In 2017, she was awarded a Charlotte Newcomb Doctoral Dissertation Fellowship with the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. Dr. Vargas is co-curator of the Mocha exhibition, Tom Kiefer, the Pertinentius, Pertinentius Belongings, which is on display right now as well. The title of Dr. Vargas's talk this evening is Sobre Vida, Religion, Race, and Migration on the mexico us Border. One quick word about format before we welcome Professor Vargas. We invite those who are attending tonight's talk via the webinar to submit your questions at any time using Zoom's Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. 
For those of you in the room, we will open the floor to your questions after Professor Marcus's remarks. In keeping with our tradition with this series, we will reserve the first few questions for students and then open the floor to everyone else. Professor Marcus, welcome to St. Louis and thank you for being here. Thank you, Rachel, for your generous introduction and thank you to the Lived Religion in the Digital Age Project, the Department of Theology and to SLUMA for extending the invitation to speak with you. The focus of my talk is religion, race, and migration, specifically as it pertains to material religion in the borderlands of Mexico and the United States. My research traces how material religion and embodied practices of Mexican Catholic lay communities in the United States have been racialized since the 19th century and how those racial stereotypes and logics continue to function today. For almost a decade, my ethnographic and archival research has led me through most of the US Southwest and border region, whether in Roman Catholic churches, botanicas, Easter pilgrimages, border shrines and historical archives, the history of US invasion and occupation of the Southwest and the international border is always part of the backdrop. I consider questions of why and how migrants are restricted from movement and how religious communities practice and innovate strategies ensuring their survival in the face of occupation, restriction, and violence, while also sustaining, creating, and affirming their presence. My book project focuses on three important moments in the history of Mexican American religion, each related to underlying questions of race, religion, citizenship, and belonging and the legal and political structures that inform these categories. So for this talk, I focus on the last of the three cases, the relationship between law enforcement surveillance and material religion, especially as it applies to traffic stops and to Catholicism. The title of the talk, the Spanish word sobrevida, can be translated as survival, and by some as afterlife. In the final part of my presentation, I reflect on the intersections of my research with the photography of Tom Kiefer and consider another way of thinking about sobrevida, the afterlives of material religion and the US-Mexico borderlands. On April 23rd, 2010, former Arizona Governor Jan Brewer signed into law Senate Bill 1070. The Support Our Law Enforcement and Safe Neighbors Act, commonly referred to as the Show Me Your Papers Law, was one of many immigrant enforcement laws related to the increase of post 9-11 surveillance. SB 1070 was characterized by two major components. First, that individuals were required to provide verification of legal residency when asked by a law enforcement officer during a lawful stop, detention, or arrest, or face imprisonment or deportation. Secondly, police officers were required to act as extensions of Homeland Security and the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, ICE, by asking for verification of legal residency and enforcement of federal immigration law. For an appearance during a traffic stop or the perceived inability to speak fluent English fit into a criteria of reasonable suspicion and could be the basis for asking individuals for proof of residency or citizenship. This reasonable suspicion also granted officers a reason to look for probable cause, most commonly leading to the search and seizure of vehicles. In Arizona, this resulted in the arrest and detention of Latinx citizens and permanent residents who could not produce proof of citizenship upon request. While in 2012, the US Supreme Court ruled to strike all but one of the provisions from the law, citing the others as unconstitutional, it upheld the ability for Arizona State Police to serve as extensions of Homeland Security and ICE in the case of reasonable suspicion. As a preventative measure in response to the passing of SB 1070, immigrant advocacy groups in Arizona advised Latinx residents to remove rosaries from their rearview mirrors as cases of racial profiling based traffic stops under the guise of obstruction of field division had already been documented in states like California and Texas. Though SB 1070 brought focused attention to race-based traffic stops and the role of police officers in immigration enforcement, 
this type of surveillance and profiling was not exceptional to California. In 2009, the San Francisco Immigrant Rights Committee, La Raza Central Legal, and numerous San Francisco residents appeared at a city hall hearing alleging that they had been pulled over and given tickets because they had a rosary hanging from their vehicle's rearview mirror. Similarly, in 2013, Latinx residents of Racine, Wisconsin voiced concern over racial profiling during traffic stops that included the president presence of rosaries in the vehicle. We can understand three important things here related to race and religion. One, that material culture, objects, symbols, and images often serve as visual markers of ethnicity and race. Two, Latinx, particularly Mexican and Mexican-American individuals are, in the eyes of law enforcement, connected to Roman Catholicism. And three, the process of racializing Mexicans in the United States often relies on visual markers of Roman Catholic presence and devotion. As early as 1999, law enforcement officials were reporting that they had been trained to identify religious decals and symbols as suspicious. In the case of U.S. versus Genaro B. Ramon, the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Texas granted a request to suppress evidence collected during a traffic stop, citing the violation of the defendant's First and Fourth Amendment rights. Two Border Patrol agents testified to trailing a Mexican driver with a passenger in an SUV outside of a Border Patrol checkpoint on Highway 385 in South Texas. They initiated a traffic stop after one agent noticed three religious decals on the back of the car, one metallic fish, one Virgin Mary sticker, and one sticker proclaiming a religious phrase, according to Agent Tashman's testimony. He had been trained to look for religious decals and symbols as they may be used by smugglers to mask criminal activity. He also testified as to the popularity of these symbols and stickers in the region, often displayed on the vehicles of individuals with more sincerely held religious beliefs than the defendant and his companion. In the case, the officer also acknowledged that, what, that while this was part of his basis for determining reasonable suspicion, he did not in fact reference any type of religious symbols in his official report. Despite the court's cautioning the border patrol against relying on religious decals and symbols as quote, an affirmative factor in making a stop will not let alone justify the stop, nor will it justify a stop where as here other factors supporting a stop are weak end quote, Similar law enforcement testimony is heard in other subsequent cases. The racial profiling of Mexicans and Mexican Americans based on material religion extends beyond states bordering Mexico. Pete Reza and Bettina Hernandez were pulled over on October 16, 2006 in Bradley County, Tennessee. Despite having run the license plates and gaining knowledge that the car was not a stolen vehicle, a police officer pulled the car over and questioned Reza and Hernandez after observing that they were of Latin American heritage and had a rosary hanging from the rearview mirror. The U.S. District Court of Tennessee at Chattanooga denied the motion to su suppress evidence in the trial despite testimony by the arresting officer. In the affidavit presented to the presiding judge, the officer stated that, quote, his suspicions were raised when he saw a rosary hanging from the rear view mirror of the vehicle because he knew that a rosary or cross is a recognized sign of drug traffickers who were seeking protection on their journey. In response, the officer stated that because the Roman Catholic faith is common among people of Hispanic heritage, and because it is well known within law enforcement circles that Hispanics are disproportionately overrepresented among drug traffickers, a rosary or cross would be consistent with this observation as well. The arresting officer again stated, however, that it was the totality of the facts and circumstances surrounding this incident and not any one specific factor that led to his suspicions, end quote. Despite the officer's testimony in this instance, the court determined that the traffic stop and subsequent search of the vehicle was legal, 
dismissing arguments that it was based on racial profiling. In this particular case, the court ruled out racial profiling as the arresting officer argued that the initial traffic stop was due to the improper use of headlights. It did not address the rosary was also used as the justification for reasonable suspicion. In 2010, 10 Latino motorists successfully sued the city of Alexander, Arkansas for racial profiling, proving that officer Tommy Leith made routine traffic stops targeting Latinos. According to the court documents, Leith identified the males based on the appearance of their skin tone, hair color, eye color, as well as the material culture displayed in their vehicles. Five of the 10 defendants had displayed rosaries on their rear view mirrors. In his deposition, Leith admitted that 75% of the citations he wrote for windshield obstructions were written to Hispanics. And two witnesses who served as ride along passengers during Leith's patrols testified that he specifically targeted Hispanics by their skin color, or sometimes he would see Mexican flags or other symbols that tended to identify the vehicle as belonging to a quote, Hispanic person. The court found Leith guilty of racial profiling and the city of Alexander liable for the officer's conduct. In the 2013 trial of Luis Fonseca Ramirez in the US District Court in Nebraska, the court denied a motion to suppress evidence despite testimony by the arresting officer that his training included identifying rosaries with smugglers who are quote, very religious or superstitious and use religious items as good luck charms, end quote. As in the Reza and Hernandez case, the court did not address any violation of the First Amendment. The decision to deny the motion to suppress rosaries as evidence in this particular case, while it is deemed racially and religiously motivating profiling in others, reveals a tension in the courts. The rosaries are considered religious markers. They're also read as visual markers of potential criminality. Other cases include testimony tying reasonable suspicion to the clutching of prayer cards, the muttering of prayers, observations of drivers making the sign of the cross, and religious images dangling from keychains. In the post 9-11 period, as many officers have testified, law enforcement training in the US related to Latinx crime has focused heavily on undocumented migration and the narcotics trade. Law enforcement officers are taught to use Mexican Catholic material objects as evidence of reasonable suspicion during traffic stops. In publications by the Department of Homeland Security, the US Marshal Service, the FBI, privately contracted experts, law enforcement officials are taught to recognize Roman Catholic practices under the, under the rubric of narco religion, which is a category that I take issue with as well. As part of the larger project of racial profiling, surveillance, and criminalization, the invocation of border security as a justification for these actions also positions migrants as potentially criminal and violent threats to the United States. It wasn't until the spring of 2017 that I encountered Tom Kiefer's photography, nearly three years after I'd begun the research on rosaries and traffic stops. His photographic image of 43 different rosaries laid out in a grid-like pattern against a gray backdrop had gone viral. The image taken from a recent New Yorker article about Kiefer's photography was accompanied with the text, rosaries confis confiscated from undocumented migrants by US border patrol agents. I learned that these rosaries were removed from the custody of undocumented migrants and deemed potentially lethal non-essential property before being discarded and had been recovered by Kiefer, who at the time was working as a custodian for the Ajo Arizona Customs and Border Prote Protection Facility. These were among the many items that he had taken from the trash and photograph. I was interested in the work of Kiefer, his collection of objects, and also in what it revealed about public understandings and perceptions of migration and religion. Kiefer's work is a snapshot, quite literally, a series of photographs into immigration detention during the Barack Obama administration, 
and also part of a larger conversation about material religion, racialization, and the border. Especially relevant to my work is the categorization of non-essential personal items and belongings as potentially lethal and the implications of this language. Material religion, including rosaries and vehicles on highways and on city streets where the driver or passengers are identified as Mexican are hyper visible points of surveillance. Their categorization as evidence of reasonable suspicion marks their owners and those who carry them with a similar hyper visibility. In the enforcement of the US-Mexico border by officers with the extended duties of immigration officials, the aim is to restrict movement or to remove them from sight through detention, incarceration, or deportation. Presence is both the tool and the concern. It is enough for reasonable suspicion and profiling, yet the religious material remains absent from the official record, as with the case of Genaro Ramon, unless by chance, of course, these cases are appealed. There are official procedures for the handling of migrant possessions, including timelines and chains of custody for itemizing, recording, storing, and returning personal belongings confis confiscated during immigration processing. However, reports show that approximately 42% of detainees at the US-Mexico border do not have all of their belongings returned. While some of this has been attributed to poor record keeping and issues involving the moving of migrants through, through different detention facilities, Kiefer's photographs reveal the practice of disposal of personal belongings within the first moments of detention. I'm struck here again by the imposition of absence, the disposal of possessions, and also the ways in which migrants are disappeared into detention centers, literally removed from the public eye and rendered invisible, but also invisibilized in a carceral system that conceals the locations of migrants from families and advocates. To me, Kiefer's photographs are as much about absence as they are about presence. In Southern Arizona, this is especially relevant as the 100,000 square miles of the Sonoran Desert, ancestral homes to more than 17 different indigenous nations have been weaponized by the US Border Patrol against undocumented migrants. As anthropologist Jason DeLeon has written about extensively, the 1994 strategy of prevention through deterrence pushed migrants away from traditional crossing points along the border, funneling them into areas of extreme weather and hostile terrain. The strategy has not deterred migrants from attempting the dangerous crossing, but has instead resulted in the deaths of over 3,200 people. Indeed, the necropolitics of the state is made invisible in these borderlands. Migrants led into potential death and disappearance. In the absence of bodies, scholars have located and theorized on material objects found in the desert, tracing the utility of objects, their use where, and what they might reveal about the migrant experience. In a similar vein, when I was participating in selecting images for the MOCRA exhibition, I approached the photographs and the items in Kiefer studio with questions of utility and survival imagining what they might reveal about the migrants who carried them. I was surprised then that though my eye was drawn towards images that resonate more closely to my research, like the Santo Toribio keychain, the Jesus Malverde scapular, I kept thinking and returning to this image, the Takis wallet. It was this green wallet, literally constructed from a plastic Takis spicy snacks bag, that pushed me into further consideration of the tension between presence um, and absence of migrants, of definitions of sacrality and categories of trash. And I return to this wallet tonight to the topic of religion, race, migration, and material objects as a point for further reflection and departure. In 1989, the scholar Tomás Ibarra Frausto 
published his foundational essay, Rasquachismo, a Chicano Sensibility, based on years of work in the Chicano art community. He defines Rasquachismo as the aesthetic cultural practice, sensibility, and underdog perspective found in Chicanx and Mexican American communities. The artist and intellectual Amalia Mesa Baines describes it as a quote, aesthetic expression that comes from discards, fragments, even recycled everyday materials, end quote. The word rasquache is a pejorative for low class, but Chicanx scholars understand rasquachismo as a cultural expression that places high value on, quote, making do with limited resources and limited means in the mending and refixing of things and of making new meaning through whatever things are available." End quote. While some observers might interpret these expressions as assemblage or found art, or even as a means of survival, rasquachismo moves beyond survival. It is an assertion of dignity, of perseverance, and of resilience. This Takis wallet is one example of rasquachismo. Created and crafted literally from available materials, the crinkly bag has been reconstituted into a new aesthetic and functional form. Examples of rasquachismo and religion are abundant in Mexican and Mexican American communities in the building of altars um, and in the decoration of rel religious images and spaces. For me, the Takis wallet image helped me begin to think more critically about how the enforcement of the borderlands with the knowledge of surveillance policy and danger often frames my consideration of migrant religion as a mechanism of survival. And while physically I have not touched the wallet, it has otherwise opened up new intersections with engaging my research. I've lived in Tucson for a little over three years um, and its proximity to the border, less than 100 miles, has enabled me to travel along and across that geographic boundary to observe and engage with religion. I began photographing borderland shrines soon upon my arrival to the region, noting their construction, speaking to devotees, and discovering, or perhaps finally noticing, the reconstitution of St. Jude Tadeus images. In different points along the border, images of St. Jude or San Judas Tadeo are prevalent. The economy and circulation of these figures can be seen at vendor stalls on the Mexico side, waiting to be bought and transported into the United States. In Nogales, Sonora, a Catholic church within walking distance of the border houses a shrine to the patron saint of lost causes, serving as a place of devotion and petition for many migrants. In official church spaces and also in roadside shrines like this one pictured here in Mexicali, many St. Jews are also displays of religious rasquachismo. Despite and in spite of fragmentation and damage, these images are reconstituted, made whole again, or become part of the larger shrine. The objects are not discarded. They do not lose meaning. And these images, um, this is um, an image of a local shrine here in Tucson um, of a box full of broken saints images. And we see um, St. Jude represented highly among these things. But the second picture here was taken um, about two weeks after the first, I photographed the first box. Um, I noticed the broken saints in the first box, and when I returned, I, I came back to see that they, they had been reconstituted um, and arranged um, in, in the shrine. So what we see are that St. Jude remains actively engaged as a connection to sacrality rather than diminished. Um, we see here another image of St. Jude um, with a cracked face, again, a, another image that's been um, reconstituted, um, as well as I think this is my favorite image, um, also taken in Tucson, of um, St. Jude reconstituted um, with two parts of two very differently sized um, images. Right? So 
and in looking at these um, altars and looking at these reconstituted St. Jude's, right, I'm thinking about this rasquache sensibility at once making do irreverent creative, right, and how they mark the landscape as a place imbued with religious life, even as the apparatus of the state seeks to render migrants invisible through violence and detention. And so I'd like to return to the title of, um, of my talk, right, to the word sobrevida. The verb sobrar translates into English literally as to be left over. But the meaning is much more nuanced. It implies to be more than enough to have an excess of. Lo que sobró, or literally what there was too much of, relates to abundance. What I might imagine as that which overflows. Sobrevida, or to sobrevivir, in my translation and in reference to my research and encounter with material religion, indicates an excess or an abundance of life. Sobrevida is literally over life, life that refuses to be contained, refuses the silences, and refuses the absences. In the context of a political and social landscape, that relegates the undocumented and other racialized communities to invisibility, incarceration, social, and even literal death, the word sobrevida, to me, takes on a meaning beyond mere survival. What might it mean to approach images of these confiscated materials with a method similar to what historians would call reading against the grain, refusing to accept absence, and instead holding space to remember the humans who carried these objects, humans very much alive, humans with communities who carried parts of their lives with them. In a landscape characterized and enforced through violence as a tactic of the state, these affirmations of life and religious life in particular are reminders that the desert is also a place of sustenance and life. Perhaps what connects those images racialized in traffic stops, the objects discarded at processing facilities, and the reconstituted St. Jude's is their presence. Presence refusing to be made absent, and presence that affirms life and humanity. These objects and images are not simply tools for survival, but integral to potential futures and afterlife.